I'm Tony Northrup, a professional photographer and huge Apple fanboy, and I am completely angry about the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max camera launches because there's so much nonsense in there. Apple is completely misleading you about things. Hey everyone, Wayne Fox here down in St. George. I just watched that video by Tony Northrup a couple days ago, and it got me thinking. <laughs> he's, he's really angry, huh? <laughs> in fact, it's like a 20 minute rant on Apple. And I guess I don't understand why a professional photographer is really worried about a phone camera that much. You know, I always get the last latest iPhone every year I upgrade. I wake up at whatever two in the morning or whatever so I can pre-order and get it right on the day. I just love new technology that's part of my problem. But you know, I've never viewed the cameras as a serious professional tool. They're handy, I document what I do with them. Uh, they're great for doing little quick video clips. Sometimes I've done a few YouTube videos using it as the video camera. But the chase for megapixels in these phone cameras is not what we think it is, and it's not what we've come to know from our camera makers. That, that's not why they're doing it. And we'll get to more of that in a minute, but I think most people misunderstand these sensors and really the goal of these phone makers. And I'm not talking about just Apple, but Google and Pixel. They're all really chasing kind of the same thing. And the reason they're using these high megapixel sensors isn't so we can make 40 by 60 prints from them. That's not what they're trying to do. Now, I'm not dissing his channel at all. He has a great channel. He's very well researched. He does a great presentation. Uh, if you haven't checked out his channel, you definitely should. There's a lot of great information there. So I don't want to discount his ability or skill, but I think if you look at his presentation in this video, I think he's made one really big assumption that really is kind of off base. Three lenses, right? Not seven lenses. So where do they get the other imaginary four lenses? Just by cropping. The 13 millimeter lens is an actual ultra wide lens. Good, the 24 millimeter actual physical lens. 28, 35, 48, totally made up. But why seven lenses? I don't even get it. They're just cropping. So here's our first clue about where he's coming up with his conclusions. We can look right here. He's claiming that the 24 megapixel lens only has a 12 megapixel sensor behind it. So he's totally discounting the fact that Apple says it's 48 megapixels. If indeed it really is only as good as a 12 megapixel sensor, then I'll admit it is marketing hype. They're just cropping. But if he's wrong, then it's not. And I think we can show that he maybe doesn't understand that 48 megapixel sensor. It was bad when the iPhone 14 Pro launched and they advertised a 48 megapixel sensor. We did a big comparison from 13 to 14 and I was hoping to see more detail and we really didn't. It's not there. And this has been true of every quad pixel sensor that we've tested. Why? Because quad pixel is marketing nonsense. They take a regular pixel in a camera sensor and just cut it in half both ways. So now it's four little pixels, but they don't have separate color information. So here we see the underlying logic behind his claim that he thinks that the quad pixel sensor is marketing garbage. I guess I puzzle why they would spend all the money to develop it. It only caps, it has the same color information and thus it's really only a 12 megapixel camera. And that's what I thought at first. When I got my iPhone 14 last year, Pro Max, I went and thought, oh, it's just a bunch of bunk, you know, that doesn't work. And so I went and shot some tests. I had this birch tree with these little fine branches and I was surprised. It, it definitely is different. Now, I don't know how he proved his test, but the more I think about it, I think I need to understand a little bit more what's going on. Now, the good thing we've got with the new iPhone is I can put it at 12 megapixel mode and it will treat those four subpixels as one pixel, which is what he says the camera's only capable of doing anyway. I can put the camera in 12 megapixel mode, take shots like he says he thinks the camera does even in 48 megapixel mode, take them in 48 megapixel mode and we can compare them side by side and we're gonna discover really quickly there's a lot more to capturing detail than fine lines on a dollar bill and especially when we're out in nature, capturing detail is about maintaining very, very subtle gradations and not necessarily clean edges but defined edges because an edge in nature isn't about, you know, one pixel is one color, one's another. It's a transition. Every edge is a transition. Zoom into any picture. The higher resolution camera you use, the more pixels are being used to define that edge, and that's why it doesn't fall apart when you start to enlarge it. So I'm going to shoot a bunch of tests, and when I get back to Salt Lake, we'll put them on my computer, do some comparisons, 
And then, you know, you can judge for yourself if he's right or if I'm right. Well, I'm back from St. George and I climbed down a way bigger rabbit hole than I thought I was ever going to. Just got curious, is this 48 megapixel sensor, you know, marketing hype, marketing nonsense, or is there really something to it? And I discovered it's, there's a lot more going on than I think people give it credit for, including myself. And I thought, well, instead of the long video where I showed all that, I'm just gonna show it briefly talk a little bit about what is going on and why we have to understand that maybe as non-engineers, we really don't understand how, even though the four subpixels have the same color filter, they can capture different information. And then kind of wrap it all up with the idea of, is using a 24, 28, 35 millimeter preset where you're gonna capture more pixels than you need to do the uh, final file, is that pure marketing nonsense or is there actually a legitimate uh, logic to it. Yeah, it is a little bit of marketing hype, I'll admit, but it's not nearly to the level I think that Tony uh, goes on about. So let's just jump in. Let me show you some samples here. We're going to dive into some serious pixel peeping, but this is all not intended to show you how awesome the sensor is. This is just to show you that it's capturing data that maybe we're not aware of, and you've really got to delve deep to try to figure it out. Okay, so I just took a quick shot out my bedroom window, took the screen out so there's no glass or anything in the way. And I did that so I'm up high enough that I can see the shingles on the roofs next door. Image on the left is taken with the iPhone in 12 megapixel mode. And so each of those four subpixels are being grouped as one single pixel. And it truly is working much like a normal 12 megapixel sensor would. Image on the right is taken with the camera in 48 megapixel mode and HEIC. So I'm not shooting raw, both of them are doing HEIC. And of course, when I do fit to view, they look pretty much identical. If we zoom into 100% on the 12 megapixel image on the left. Now, I don't know how well this will show on the device you're watching this on. Uh, I'm on a nice 32 inch monitor here. Uh, it's actually a 4K monitor, so I have a lot, of, a lot of pixels with data. It's really obvious to me that the tree here in this region here has way more detail than the one here. Uh, I can actually see a lot of clarity in the leaves. I can distinguish some small branches here that have disappeared over here. So it's definitely we're catch, capturing more data. Let's actually zoom into 100% on the 48 megapixel uh, shot. And let's just see if we can pick up a little more. So now we're at 100% with the 48 megapixel shot. We're already pixelating because we're at 200% on the one on the left. And we have way more clarity. The leaves are still easily identifiable as individual leaves. I have areas of the sky peeking through in this region right here that are beginning to kind of bleed out. I don't have as much color here. There's not as many highlights. And the branches here, uh, you can see here, I'm getting kind of this wormy pattern where here I can still distinguish individual leaves. I have leaves sitting on this roof that I can clearly see in this image on the right. And here I can pick up a few blobs here and there, but you can see how the shingles have mushed together, leaves have disappeared. If I look at this tree in the background, I have some good texture to the leaves here. And here it's definitely not as clean of texture. If I scroll down in the image, we've got this uh, deer garden in my neighbor's backyard. The fence here is much cleaner, much sharper. I can look at the texture and the color rendering of this camouflage here which is much more detailed than this here. I noticed one thing, how much these Edison bulbs looks much more like little clear light bulbs than over here. Even in the fence in the front, how much cleaner this fence looks than here. I mean, I could go on and on and on. It's obvious that we're getting way more detail from that 48 megapixel sensor. To kind of understand why, I'm gonna do something I normally don't do. I'm gonna do some serious pixel peeping. We're gonna go into the pixel level and compare them. Okay, so we're just gonna dive in so we can actually see some individual pixels, something you'd never actually do unless you're really like me trying to understand what's going on here. We're gonna start zooming in here on the image on the right. I'm gonna try to zoom in and focus on this little patch of blue sky right there. And as you can see, once we get to 300%, how this patch of blue sky's sort of blending out. The leaves are definitely lost their definition. I can still tell these are leaves and branches. I'm having a hard time with the one on the left with that. Let's zoom in a little bit further. And what I wanted to point out here was how this blue information, this sky that's peeking through has pretty much, is pretty much gone. 
Uh, as you can see, this blue down here that I can see, there's barely a hint of blue here. And here I have a pretty good blue. And the reason why is pretty basic if we zoom in even more. So let's see some individual pixels here. It's actually getting hard, hard to actually tell. So here's my branch and here's that patch of blue sky. This is that other patch of blue sky. But I have all of these pixels defining that. And here I just don't have enough. Uh, the detail is too small for the resolution of the pixels on the sensor. Now this is a little crazy because we're not trying to resolve this tree to print a 60 by 80 inch print. What we're trying to decide is if we use less than 48 megapixels of the sensor, is that a valid way to get good data? So is the concept of digital zoom and quality actually working? Because that's what these camera makers, these camera phone makers are really trying to do. If we go in a couple more uh, clicks here, uh, let's just go one more. We've broken it down to individual pixels. You can see that one square over here equals four squares over here. Blue area here is that piece of sky. This is that piece of sky here. It's clear that we're recording a lot of different color information. And the main thing we're recording is different densities. And that's why I think I kind of misunderstood what's going on. Okay, so what is going on here? I think if we understand a little bit about what we're capturing when we capture light and the properties of it, it'll help a little bit. You know, in my color management videos, I often show how you can graph colors on a three-dimensional scale. One aspect of that scale is the luminance value. In other words, how much light did that sensor capture? And of course, the other is the color, and that's the saturation. Each sensor can only capture red, green, or blue light, but when we do the bare uh, demosaicing, we can recreate the original color. Uh, that's, we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. But if you think about it, if we talk about the luminance value, the closer we get to white and black, the less saturation we have. But when we start recording fine transitions, a lot of times that is the very critical component. An example, let's say we have a ball, it's one color, it's very smooth. We light it in such a way that there's no specular highlights, but it, we're creating a three-dimensional shape by shading on the side. As that shadow information is being recorded, it's not getting a different color. The color of the ball hasn't changed, but it is giving a different luminance because less light is being reflected. And each of those four little pixels can record a individual luminance value. And I think that's critical to how this works because most of the time when we're down to that small of a pixel, we're trying to record a transition or a very subtle difference from what's next to it. And most of that has to do with the luminous value and not the actual color. I think that once you kind of look at it from that aspect, you can understand why there's definitely a lot more going on because the luminous many times is the more critical part of recording detail than the actual color. I also think there's one other pretty important factor that we might be overlooking here. When we take an image with a camera with a bare sensor on it, each of those pixels is recording either the red, the green, or the blue light. If I take an image such as this one and I break it down to what's being actually recorded, all it is is a bunch of grays. And you'll see here if I zoom into the pixel level, each of those squares is a little bit different gray mainly because they have a different color of uh, filter on the top. Now I can actually overlay the color filter that this pixel saw, and it reflects not only the color, but the density. So as you can see here, I have all these red, green, and blue squares, and they get darker. Now you tell me how I get from this mass of color to this image here, which is the final demosaiced image pretty mind-blowing. And what Bryce Bear did figuring out that if we he can take the data around a pixel and extrapolate the original color or awfully close to it blows my mind. Now, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not going to second guess anybody, but I have no doubt that what the engineers that develop these quad pixel sensors doing very possibly could be doing something similar. They can take the sub pixel and they can say, Okay, we know the pixel next to this is green. Let's look at its luminous value, but then let's look at the pixel next to that and see what color, uh, how much red light there was. And so we can go beyond those other pixels. I don't know that they haven't figured out a way to use the pixels around it still, and even on a pixel by pixel basis, extrapolate the color 
or at least a very close uh, proximity to the color that was actually there in the scene. Uh, I'm not going to, it's obvious there's a lot more going on. We've got to give them a lot more credit than we are. This 48 megapixel quad pixel sensor is way beyond my engineering skill, my knowledge, and it definitely is doing a lot more than I ever thought it could because I thought just like Tony, my, my original rationalization or reasoning was exactly like his. You can't do this because it's the same pixel. You can't just cut them in half. Obviously, the engineers have figured a way to do it. And so uh, it's pretty amazing to me. So that 48 megapixel sensor is way more capable than I thought it was, than Tony thinks it is. And a little bit of research and diving into it, it didn't take me long to prove that it's way more capable than I thought it was. Now, I've never bothered doing that before because I really didn't care. And I think we as photographers still get kind of forget that they're not doing it so we can make big prints. They're doing it for digital zoom. For that, it works pretty well. Now, the idea that they're using a typical uh, field of view metaphor, such as 28 millimeter, 35 millimeter. Yeah, they are just cropping the sensor, but they still have way more data than they need to create their file. It's not like they're cropping it to his level. For example, he says that the 28 millimeter crop is only 8.8 .8 megapixels, and that actually is about 35 megapixels of data from that 48 megapixel sensor. And even at 28 or 35 millimeter, we're still using about 25 megapixels of data for that. And so the idea that they're doing that, I mean, my Fuji does that. I can put a 50 millimeter lens on, but I can throw the Fuji into 35 millimeter mode, which is cropping down as when I've got a smaller sensor in there. And I have an 80 millimeter equivalent field of view. Uh, you know, the crop factor changes. Apple could have easily thrown the same lens on there, another one of them, put a little smaller sensor in. They could have physically cropped and put another one in, but why do that? It, it's not that far out there. Yes, it's a little marketing hype, I'll admit, but it's not this whole Apple is totally deceiving you thing. Well, enough is enough. That was a fun video to make. I certainly learned a lot about the iPhone camera phone and obviously other quad pixel sensors that I didn't know before. Hope it was at least entertaining. Thanks for watching the video. If you liked it, just hit that like button. It might help me out a little bit. Until next time, see ya.